Um, all right, so usernames and passwords, uh, not exactly the most strongest authentication method. Uh, while I'm thinking about it, there is another way that's kind of interesting. If, you're, if you don't want to have to mess with passwords, there's actually another authentication method, which is a one-time password. So when they want to use the system, they, enter their use, their, their, they just enter their email address, and then the system will email them their one-time password, and they get their email or an SMS or you know, some, some external third-party channel to get that password. And then they enter that in, and then they're able to use the system. And then the next time they want to use the system, they just enter their email address again. It emails them their password, a new one. So you can never enforce it because the password is always different, right? And um, and you can even have it where they can't even log in unless they've requested, obviously, a password. So that's another thing to think about, especially for systems that are kind of one-off, like proxy voting or you know something that only occurs once a year, maybe to update a medical record for your doctor. You don't necessarily have to store a username and password for them. You can get away with just giving your email. You can make it as, as simple as that. And it's if it's not if they're not using the system every day, then it's not really a hassle. I mean, it's, they probably won't remember the password anyways, and they'll probably have to get an email to them themselves anyway. So it is something to consider. Would you then just have a link or or type it in that place so you don't get them to the log or anything? Well, you, you can you can do it one of a couple ways. Yeah, you could just actually just email them a link that takes them straight into the site. You don't even have to make them then enter in the challenge. It kind of depends on if you're sending them a text message to their phone, then they're going to have to take that pin and type it in to get into the system. But if you're sending it to an email address, then providing them with a link or providing both and letting them use because they might receive an email to their phone and then want to enter it into something else, so like a public terminal. Or something. So anyways, that's just something to keep in mind. It's, it's another one that I don't see talked about too much, but it, and it's not in this presentation, but it's an interesting one for certain uh, uses. Two-factor authentication is when you want to bump up the uh, reliability of the person who says they are is who they really are. And it works off of two things. Something you know, which is usually your username and password, and then either something you hold, like a, a token, a little token device, or uh, something you are, such as uh, biometrics, you know, like your thumbprint. And so by using your thumbprint and your username and password, or using your username and password with uh, a little device, or it can be SMS messages or uh, a one-time password that's sent to the email, you can then, um, these tokens can then be used to further authenticate. And a lot of, I, from my understanding, there's some banks here in Europe that actually use that a lot. And I know my bank uses it too for the high value when I'm transferring large money. All right, um, I was thinking of writing this in Lasso, but I thought it would be fun just to kind of have it up there and I think it's Java. It's not, I don't know. Um, the, idea, <laughs> the idea here is uh, you, you always want to fail closed. Uh, so you always want to make sure that if the authentication doesn't work, that you default to them being a guest on your system versus well, if I don't know who they are, I'll just make an administrator. So um, <laughs> <laughs> you can do that, but it wouldn't be good. Um, it goes back to if you hate the person you're working for. So what you can see here is it starts out and it says, you know, by default, they have no authentication and their security role is nothing, it's null. And then the try block, that's the same as a protect block uh, in Lasso. And what that says is, is anything inside of there, if, it, if anything goes wrong, then run the catch block, which you blow it. And, uh, and again, what it does is it sets it back to where the user is, is not known to the system. And you can see what it does is it goes through and it checks and sees, okay, well, is, uh, you know, is their password correct? Does it match? Is their user account, is it locked? Um, you know, and is their security role such that they've been banned or that they have no security role, maybe they're new to the system. So if it passes all that, then they're authenticated and they have a role. Otherwise, if anything else bad happens, database is, in avail is unavailable, they obviously entered the wrong user and password, then they're not authenticated. Any questions on that? All right, authorization, that's 
the next step. After they've authenticated, you know who they are, now you need to know, well, what can they do on my system? And uh, you, you basically you use this to then make sure that you protect resources that they shouldn't have access to and, and allow them to get to the resources they shouldn't have access to. And generally, they're role-based. They don't have to be. Um, principle of least privilege is where you want to give them just enough privilege to do absolutely everything they need to do and nothing more because if their account is compromised and they have access to the PO system but they don't do anything with POs normally, then it doesn't really make sense to allow an attacker access to the PO systems because even this user isn't supposed to have access to them. There was actually something in the news recently where a contractor had access to the Department of Defense records and he got caught looking at it when, so he had access to it, but he didn't have authorization. But it, the system didn't enforce it. It just relied, and, but it did come up with a big screen warning, you're entering a secure system, and it's tracked by the FBI, and I, I guess the FBI broke down his door or something. So it's better if you just enforce it. If you know he's not supposed to have access to it, it'd be better to just keep him out. Anyways, he's, he's going to jail. So. Um, all your, uh, all your authorization routines should be in a central location, either a custom tag or an include. Uh, something that when, if there's a change, you find an insecurity or you change how it works, you don't want to be changing it on all you know thousand pages of your application because you might miss some. And then suddenly this user that's not supposed to have access does have access to some pages. So to prevent that, you're going to want to make sure that your uh, authorization routines are in a central location so that when you make one change, it takes place across the board for all your pages. Author ma authorization matrix is just simply where you de where you define this page has these users that are allowed to see it, and these are the things the actions are allowed to do on this page. So a normal user can, can look at a blog, but a, you know the blog owner can actually look at it and edit it. And so and you want to make sure that on every page you do this check through this authorization matrix so that you understand that this is the you know, authenticated person and this is the authorization they have on this page. You also want to make sure that you protect your static resources. These are things like PDF files. Uh, there was something recently, very recently, I think I even sent it the last talk list, where uh, the uh, subversion files were available on the production server, and so anybody could just browse the subversion you know, data that was on the production server and see the source code for the entire site, and of course all the revisions. And if you have, you know, obviously you see the keys and whatnot in there, you know, secret passwords, then an attacker would have access to all that. So you want to make sure that anything that's static that sits on your site is somehow protected either through Lasso or you can also use Apache directives to protect it. So when you do authorization, you want to make the best way to do it is to use a framework because a framework then is battle tested by multiple users and it generally will implement the best of breed as far as what to do and when to do it. Uh, obviously we're not all security experts, so getting it right the first time is hard to do getting it right the tenth time is hard to do. So using something that's pre-existing that's been battle tested on lots and lots of sites is, uh, is a great way to keep yourself protected without having to expend a lot of money to double check that you've got it all correct.